Praise the Lord for his goodness. We read of his goodness in Isaiah 11 this morning, congregation. Let's turn in our Bibles to Isaiah 11. And looking specifically at the destination of the peace that Jesus has won for us by his blood on the cross. When he took the curse, he really took care of the curse on the cross so that what's ahead for us is perfect shalom. Shalom. Isaiah 11. Let's read the entire chapter. Found on page 683 in your pew Bibles. Picture of the future of God's kingdom after Jesus comes. Starting with what we celebrate on Christmas Day in verse 1. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. And a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth and he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins the wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together and a little child shall lead them The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. That's the poisonous snake, the adder. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. In that day, the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time to recover the remnant that remains of his people from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and from the coastlands of the sea. He will raise a signal for the nations. He will assemble the banished of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The jealousy of Ephraim shall depart, and those who harass Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not be jealous of Judah, and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. But they shall swoop down on the shoulder of the Philistines in the west, and together they shall plunder the people of the east. They shall put out their hand against Edom and Moab, and the Ammonites shall obey them, and the Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the sea of Egypt, and will wave his hand over the river with his scorching breath, and strike it into seven channels and he will lead people across in sandals and there will be a highway from Assyria for the remnant that remains of his people as there was for Israel when they came from the land of Egypt. He's going to bring together all the nations into Israel which is of course no longer in the Middle East but spread out over the whole globe the Israel of God. Our text is verses 6 through 9. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together. The, uh, The lion shall eat straw like the ox. 
The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is God's word. We praise him for it. Brothers and sisters, in Jesus, the Greek word for peace is Irene or Irene. The Hebrew word for peace is shalom or salam. And shalom is such a rich and beautiful reality that it is impossible for us here in this veil of tears to describe it. We have pictures, we have images, but to understand it and to describe it is beyond words. Paul says, I has not seen, nor has the ear heard, nor has the mind of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Nothing we have seen here, nothing we have heard here, nothing our mind can imagine here can compare, can measure up to the glory, the shalom, the perfection that's coming of the peace that waits for them, for us. One of my favorite word pictures of shalom of the new creation is Isaiah 11. The prince of peace who came to Bethlehem was born of the Virgin Mary and put in a manger over whom the angels sang glory to God in the highest and peace on earth among those in whom God takes delight or God takes pleasure. This Prince of Peace will bring us to this place of peace described in Isaiah 11. And I know it seems like a long ways away. In fact, this picture seems so far away, it might not even seem possible for you that this could ever happen. So one of the things we want to look at for a moment is this event real what we read about in Isaiah 11? Or is this hope of glory, of shalom, just a drug people use to help them get through this hard life? The opiate of the masses. But it's not real. But everybody needs a fantasy to help them get through the day. Is that what this is? Or is this real? And another question, because it is real, Is this your life's destination? Is this your goal? Is this your dream? Is this what you're longing and hoping for? A world where God is all in all. Are you getting lost in the things, the issues, the worries, the fears, the troubles, the work, the wealth, the amusements of this world? Getting lost in the weeds. That's a challenge also, also before the people of God. Always has been. And that's why God keeps placing before us that Christ-focused glory so we don't lose our way. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Well, I want to look at three things here. We look at the perfect destination. First, the powerful Redeemer who will get us there. Secondly, the restored paradise that he's bringing us into. And thirdly, the perfect harmony, perfect relationships that will be for us there. First then, the powerful redeemer. The world of Isaiah 11, 6 through 9 congregation doesn't just appear out of nowhere. It doesn't just by accident drop on us one day. No. The world of Isaiah 11, 6 through 9 is directly tied to the Messiah of Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 5. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Remember what Isaiah 
6, 7, 8, 9, 10 tell us that the world of Israel and Judah, God's people, has become so corrupt that it's like a tree that God's going to cut down and there's just a stump left. We can't even call it David's tree because David has become so obscure, so we'll call it Jesse's tree. That's how low things have come cut down. And just when Israel and Judah are convinced there's no hope, but a shoot will come from the stump. Hmm. A branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And this shoot is not wood. He's a person. We read of him in verse 2, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest on him this shoot, this branch. And if you notice what he's like, this hymn, this shoot, it's a sevenfold spirit. We'll sing of that afterward in number 302, a sevenfold spirit, the spirit of the Lord, number one, shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom, of understanding, of counsel, of might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. This is the only kind of person who can bring world peace, who can bring shalom, who can bring the perfect world that we're all longing and hoping for. Nobody on earth is able to get us into that, bring us to this spot. It's got to be somebody coming from heaven, landing on the earth, and being full of the Holy Spirit. Somebody whose delight, verse 3, shall be in the fear of the Lord. You know, when we look for political leaders, we look for people with a certain amount of clout, and we look at their policies and their positions. But do we ever say, we want somebody who's full of the Spirit of the Lord, nothing else really matters? That's who he is, this prince of peace, this child born to us, this son born to us, spoken of in Isaiah 9, now described as a shoot and a branch from Jesse's cut-off stump, this amazing person who is anointed with the fullness of the Spirit of God without measure, the sevenfold Spirit of God. What hope for the stump? What hope for our lives? Sometimes we get to a spot where sin has just cut us down. Our own foolishness has just cut us down. Do you know that if you're in that spot, and that when the church is in that spot, and church often gets to that spot in history, it's wearing down in our own culture too, that even there, We have a redeemer who gives us hope, new life, and can bring us out of that spot of death and being cut down to this glory and shalom and peace and joy. There's the only safe place for the church and for any human being in all the world. The only safe place for your life. Don't look for your safety in health and fitness. It will eventually, you will eventually fall apart. Don't look for your safety, your place of peace in relationships, human relationships. They will disappoint you. Even the best person will get weak and die. Medicine will not cure you finally. Drugs and booze are a refuge of lies. They pretend to make life good, but they wreck you. Only the Prince of Peace, only God's Messiah, God's Redeemer, can get you to this place where the wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat. Nobody else can cure you and cure the world. 
Nobody else can take away our sin and give us peace with God and make us right with God and bring us to eternal life. And how will he bring us to the world of verses 6 through 9? Well, look at his rule. He, verse 3b, shall not judge by what his eyes see. He doesn't judge by mere appearance. Or decide disputes by what his ears hear. He doesn't decide things by hearsay or popular opinion. This king, this prince of peace. No, but with righteousness, he will judge the poor, the meek, the weak. Who trust in God. That's who the poor are in the Bible. And decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist. Faithfulness the belt of his loins. He is always righteous, always faithful. These are his theme of his kingship, his rule. He never fails you. He never changes his mind. He never fails in his policies, in his person, in his character. This is the one the world needs. This is the one the world has been given. This is the one we know in God's covenant of grace. But notice those words in verse 4. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked, kill the wicked. That's referring not just to the gospel ministry through history, where through his word, he breaks down the wicked and converts them and brings them to Christ and brings them into his church as the rest of Isaiah 11 speaks about. Going out and bringing in Philistia and Assyria by bringing out the sword of the word, of the gospel, to tear them down in their pride and remake them in faith. But finally, what verse 4 is talking about, striking the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, slaying the wicked, those are words used in 2 Thessalonians 2 to describe his second coming, the day of the Lord, when he will come and destroy the ungodly. And the ungodly, their ungodly works. And all the corruption of this world. With the breath of his mouth. By his word. By a command. It's by his word that he made the world. And that he restores the world. But he also destroys the wickedness in the world. And on that day. Maranatha. That he returns. By the breath of his mouth, he will clear away all that is wrong. And he will bring in everything that's right, the world of verses 6 through 9. So just to see that this world of perfect peace and rest and shalom is brought to us through the Prince of Peace, verses 1 through 5. Through his first coming... And through the ministry of peace in the gospel that keeps increasing to the end, but finally and fully in his second coming. It all hangs on the powerful Redeemer. Brothers and sisters, if you want to make it there, you got to believe in him and follow him here. He's the only way there. So many expect to make it to heaven without following Jesus. It's just an entitlement. I'm a good person. God owes it to me. God owes us hell. We are not good. Only Jesus is. And our only entrance into the world to come, that world of glory, is through the person and work of Jesus. Trust in him. Believe in him. Come to him. No matter how broken your stump is, your life, how messed up your family tree, come to him. 
You who are weary and burdened, he will give you rest here already. And the rest to come unimaginable. As we navigate the struggles and uh, troubles as pilgrims in this world, we are headed for a glorious destination, dear people of God, dear believers in Jesus Christ. Well, let's see, secondly, the paradise restored. What is this world that he's bringing? Here again, we have a picture of the perfect world. It's tied to the Prince of Peace. The wolf, I'm going to read that again, shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. Just picture that. Here's a little child with a rope. He's got a calf on one side. He's got a lion on the other, and it's all sweet. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together. Here are cows and bears not only getting along with each other, but their calves and their little cubs are also frolicking together in the grass, and it's all okay. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox, no longer a lust for blood. But he's grazing side by side with the ox. And the nursing child, the little baby, shall play over the hole of the cobra. He'll put his hand inside. Here, snakey, snakey. And there'll be no problem. The weaned child shall put his hand in the adder's den. Here are reminders of the Garden of Eden when there was perfect harmony between man and animals and all creation. And right now, Jesus is in heaven saying, Behold, I am making all things new. I am preparing this world for you. He's saying that right now. He's not only redeeming lost sinners. Don't think of salvation merely as a salvation of souls. But he's redeeming a church, and he's redeeming all creation. A few weeks ago, we saw that in Romans 8. All creation is groaning, standing on its tiptoes, looking for Release from bondage to decay that, that the curse of sin on sin has brought upon this world. The curse is tearing it apart, but Jesus took the whole curse upon himself on the cross, not just the curse of our sin, our own punishment. But the curse of creation he took upon himself when the sun departed from him and he was left in darkness. He bore the curse of man, his people, and of creation there on the cross. And Colossians 1 said, God was pleased through Jesus to reconcile to himself all things including the material world. All things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Yes, the blood of Jesus has the power not just to redeem people, but creation. It's through the blood that this world of shalom will come about. The wolf shall live with the lamb. Right now, we live in a dangerous, ferocious, vicious world. People are vicious. They're vicious with their tongues, by their gossip and backbiting. We're vicious with our thoughts and our coveting and plotting. We're vicious in our feelings with our anger and malice and hatred and lust. We're vicious in our actions with murder and rape and recklessness. And the animal world is vicious too, from the tick that brings Lyme's disease to the poisonous spider to the snake and the lion and the crocodile and the wolf and the dog that bites. And the climate is vicious. The storm, the hurricane, the earthquake, the flood, the drought, the virus. It's not safe to live here. And the sin of Adam and Eve and our sin in them brought that curse of danger and viciousness upon the world. 
There's so much taming that's required. When you see this tame world, totally tamed world of Isaiah 11, that's the work of Jesus. He tames sinners. From vicious backbiters and me-centered haters to people that love, who love the Lord and love each other. And I know that that, that old viciousness never totally gets out of our system, and we have to struggle against that all the time. But that world of shalom has already started in the people of God, hasn't it? In you? And if we keep have, we have to keep praying for the Prince of Peace to grow that culture of peace in your life so that you're a peacemaker. But in the world to come, all viciousness will be gone in people, in animals, in the environment. And when Jesus returns, he will bring heaven with him, the way the book of Revelation reads it. He'll bring paradise down with him, and the perfect peace of heaven will settle upon the earth. And as he comes, his holiness and the word of his mouth will burn away all that's evil, all that's corrupt, and destroy it, and cast Satan and his angels and the ungodly all into the lake of fire. And heaven will come down and settle upon the earth and make everything perfect again. So it'll be like the Garden of Eden magnified a million times. A wonderful place of perfect shalom, brothers and sisters. Far more than the absence of war. That's not shalom in the Bible. That's not peace in the Bible. It's much more. It's presence of harmony where everything is just right and there's nothing to harm or destroy and no harsh words are spoken there and no unkind thoughts, no wrong feelings. Nothing is broken there. There is no worry there. There is no pain. And the animals will get along there. Today, if you put a wolf with a lamb, the wolf will thank you for the tasty lunch, right? That's the way it's going to be, but not there. Their desire to harm and kill will be taken away, and Jesus' new world will be so harmless that a child can put a lion and a calf on a rope and go for a walk with them. As we said, a baby can stick his hand in the cobra's den, and nothing bad will happen. It's a picture. But it's a real picture. Yes, there are animals in the first world God made. There will be lots of animals in the new world Christ is making right now and preparing for us that inheritance that is waiting. Trees, rivers, animals, and the whole redeemed church of God living in perfect harmony. Now, Bruno's not going to be there. Your dog that died... No, and Candy, the, the canary, that poor canary that died, can, Candy's not going to be there either. Okay? There's no resurrection for animals. Sorry. That's just for people. But God will fill his new world with creatures, with animals of all kinds. And the whole redeemed church will live there in harmony, a multitude from every tribe and language and people that no one can number. And the takeaway for us in our culture is we've lost this totally. Science cannot create this new world. It really thinks it can. Medicine cannot create this new world. Human government will not be able to give this to us. The messianic impulse of human pride is so strong in the human race. We really think we will be able to eradicate disease and anger and violence and death and disasters and war by human ingenuity. We really think we've got the power. I don't know why we haven't figured it out, but that's the deception, the deceptiveness of sin. That we can't do this. We really believe in ourselves. Really After all we see, after all this time, we really think we have the power to make this. It's ridiculous. 
Only Jesus Christ, by his blood, has the power to reverse the curse and create a new world. And that's what Psalm 98 says, and we sang that yesterday with joy to the world. When Jesus returns to judge the living and the dead, the whole world will be made new. Let the rivers clap their hands and the hills sing for joy together. And Isaac Watts described it this way, No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. And just one more thing for a moment. It's a world of perfect relationships. Look at the last verse of this text, verse 9. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Let me ask you this. What will pervade this new world of peace Jesus restores? What will fill it from top to bottom, from east to west, from north to south? What will fill every corner and every activity and every moment and every space? Is it power? No. Is it happiness? No. Is it freedom? No. Though there will be perfect power, happiness, and freedom there. But what will fill it, first of all? What's the main thing? You see it? See the answer? The knowledge of the Lord. The knowledge of God. Just like Messiah himself in 11 verse 2. He's filled with the knowledge and fear of the Lord. With wisdom and understanding. Well, his people too will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. And what does that mean? To know the Lord in the Bible means intimate fellowship with him. Perfect communion. You know him as your friend and savior. You know his will. You delight in him. You are absolutely committed to him. You will obey him no matter what. And where. A world where everybody is totally driven from the, with the knowledge of the Lord. From beginning to end, all day long, and then through the night, and wherever you are, and whatever you do, whatever you say, there's only one thing that's filling you and driving you. It's the knowledge of the Lord. As much as the, the waters fill the earth, cover the sea. As much as the waters cover the sea, and they cover every square inch, Right? A world where all God's people are so dominated by the knowledge of God that is never missing in anything they do or say, in any amount at all. It's always full bore, the knowledge of God. Well, that's a world that's totally, totally safe, totally tamed by the Lord Jesus Christ where there's no viciousness, no evil thought, no evil word, no evil feeling, nothing that makes me unsafe toward you or you unsafe toward me, where everything will be just right. Perfect relationship with God will result in perfect relationship with each other and all creation. And all the people in this new world will live together and work together and worship together and relax together in perfect harmony. What a world Jesus is preparing for us. What peace, what shalom. Jesus truly is glory to God in the highest and peace on earth among those with whom God is pleased. What a world. You know, if you don't love God now, and you don't love his church now, heaven is not going to be the place for you, because that's what that's all about. You need to take a look at yourself and say, am I ready? Is that my destination? Final question. How do you know all this is real? Maybe the hope of heaven is just a drug we take to help get us through the day, feel better about our miserable lives here on earth. Maybe it's all a myth. Well, brothers and sisters, it's true. It's as true as creation. If God could make this the first time, and he did, even though it was impossible for us, 
and the evidence is all around us. He can make it happen again. Absolutely no sweat, no problem. It's, it's nothing for him to do that. So don't measure this possibility by our own ability. But by the ability of God to do amazing things, which and the world is teeming with amazing things. And the other thing is that somebody has actually arrived there already. Somebody from the human race, Jesus. He died under the curse to set us free from the curse. He rose again and now lives in this glorious shalom. Somebody's there. He's proof. So, brothers and sisters, there's an eternity waiting for you on the other side of this life. Do you want to spend that eternity suffering in hell apart from God? If you reject him, that's the horror that's waiting for you. But do you want to spend that eternity in the glory of heaven on earth and believe in God? Trust in Jesus, his son. And then a perfect world where God is all in all is waiting for you. Is that your hope? Is that your dream? Is that number one? Lord God, through your Son and Spirit, make this number one in my life all the time. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beauty and the glory that have dawned upon this world in Jesus Christ, your Son that have been purchased for us through his blood. And now that is being prepared for us from his throne in heaven. And one day, Lord Jesus, you will come us and take us into that perfect peace and rest. Lord, help us to long for this. Draw us to Jesus, your son, so that this world, this inheritance, becomes ours by faith. And bring others, Lord, into this inheritance who right now do not know you and do not have this peace that they might also enter this hope of shalom now and this actual shalom when Jesus returns. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.